Hi, my name is Michael Savoldi. I'm a retired a college professor. I taught farrier science for the animal and veterinarian sciences at the California State Polytechnic University located in Pomona, California. I was also the resident farrier for the W.K. Kellogg Arabian Horse Center, which is located on the Cal Poly campus. That position was a great position. I actually had two positions. Um, I was faculty, which included my teaching uh, portion, and I was uh, staff, which uh, was my blacksmithing uh, portion of my jobs for 30 years. I had a wonderful job, wonderful place to work at. The students were all great, and uh, and it was my hobby. Not many people can say their work is their hobby, but I'm one of them, and it's made me very happy, and I really like horses. And so I've studied the foot for a long time, and now I just like to share with everyone some of the things I've learned over time, some of my observations. Today's discussion, we're going to try to talk about the heel of the horse's foot. Pathophysiology, again, is my favorite thing. Um, to study because it's, it includes pathology, which is the study of disease, and physiology, which is the study of the of the organisms and the and the functions. Uh, together, I've learned a lot uh, over the years, and I, again, I just like to share with everyone what I've learned. So let's uh, since we're talking about the heel of the horse, we need to um, do a little quick. Uh, demonstration of anatomy so we can kind of follow along. So we are going to use a cadaver limb. Uh, it was uh, collected at a local rendering plant for demonstration purposes and research purposes only. So here we see the lower portion of a horse's leg with the hoof capsule or the foot covered, the hoof capsules covering the foot. And I'm going to remove the hoof capsule so we can get a general idea of what's happening underneath this capsule. So we're looking at soft tissue. This all we could go into quite detail, but I'm trying to keep this short. So we'll just uh, introduce the soft tissue, the the material that lies underneath the hoof capsule. It's very delicate, it's sensitive, and it requires a lot of respect. When we remove the sensitive structure. We now can see the P3 bone. The P3 bone is this area right here, kind of in a little darkish red area, and then ungual cartilages that come up the foot and uh, just portions of the foot that lie underneath the capsule. And uh, the main word here is the sole plane. The sole plane is something that we really need to pay attention to. Is, it's everything about this foot is, is, is uh, pliable, um, it's flexible, and it can become distorted. And when the sole plane distorts, this foot will have start to pick up some serious problems within. Another area that I will mention is the sole interface with the white line and the hoof wall. This is a stable area, and it's a very good. Uh, landmark to use for um, understanding or explaining the foot. Because as you can see, this foot has been trimmed to the sole plane and it represents the true foot of the horse. So I'm gonna introduce a foot that's a little different than this one at this time. And that's a, a more of an upright type of foot. We put a window in the foot so we can see the heel area and try to understand some of the heel area. So first we see the exfoliating sole. That's that white looking tissue that you see here. It just doesn't look very healthy. The next layer, or if we migrate up just a little bit, is the hard epidermal sole. Now that's just like a skin uh, covering the bottom of the foot to protect the inner structures. Skin has a, our skin has a tendency to, um, to develop cells inside for it to build the skin and to slough off old cells. 
and the epidermal sole does the same thing. This can just be a combination of, of uh, old cells sloughing off mixed with dirt and debris and things like that. It's important that we keep the bottom of the foot clean. It'd be nice if we would wash it out quite often to keep it clean, to try to prevent anaerobic bacteria from developing and other things such as that. And then on top of our going migrating upward, we can have the dermal lamella, and that's a very sensitive structure. So now that we have three areas of the foot to, to look at, we can start to de define a heel. So we can first start by cleaning out the, the exfoliating sole. So here we have the same foot with the exfoli exfoliating sole removed. All of that tissue has been take, removed and cleaned up. And now we can put our heel into two parts. If we look at the distal border of the, here's our epidermal sole. If we start at the distal border of the epidermal sole, and by look downward towards the ground, see how the horse is standing on this foot, we can call this length of wall. That elevates the foot off of the ground. Now, the reason I use the sole plane for my research is if I wish to do measurements, uh, let's say I wanted to measure the vertical depth of this foot or measure the wall. Well, I definitely would have a different measurement measuring this one than I would on measuring this one. This foot has been trimmed to its anatomy. And so now I have a good view and a, a good measurement to rely on when I'm measuring the vertical depth of the foot in this heel area. This measurement, in my opinion, is a false measurement because we're including length of wall beyond the sole plane. So we're just, to me, that measurement really doesn't mean a whole bunch. Uh, because it's not, it's only telling me, if I wanted to measure length of wall, measuring length of wall, I would not measure the whole hoof capsule. I would measure from the distal border of the sole plane to the bottom of the, to where the wall ends. That would give me measurements of wall. That way I can judge uh, how tissue flows over, over a chewing period and get an idea if I can change the flow, the rate, how the tissue flows uh, in its growth pattern. Another area we can address then is the actual heel of the horse. So, we're, so now knowing that we have two parts in our discussion, when I refer to length of wall, I will be talking about any excess wall length beyond the sole plane. And if I'm talking about the heel, I would be talking about the true heel of the horse from the distal border of the sole, sole to the maybe the proximal border or the hairline. Proximal is close to the animal, closer to the animal. Distal is furthest away from the animal. So let's remove the hoof capsule on this foot and take a look at stance. It's extremely important how a horse stands on its foot. This is something that our industry doesn't discuss very often, and yet it's very critical. You see, horseshoeing techniques vary. There's many different types of ways a person can trim a horse's foot. Remember that every trimming technique has its positives and it has its negatives, and we should be aware. I wish people giving that would talk about trimming techniques would talk about the negatives uh, to bring the attention uh, to the person they're talking with that although we can do the trim a foot this way, could be positive for a certain area. I'll, I'll talk about the negatives to this foot in just a second, but we need to include the negatives. Now, quarter horse uh, shoeing, I think it's changing, at least I'm hoping it's changing, but they will do a lot, leave a lot of heel on a horse's foot. They'll trim the toe short and leave a lot of heel. So now the horse is in an improper position or an uncomfortable position for the horse to stand on its foot. And the horse will tell you in several different ways that they don't like their feet trimmed this way. So if I take and remove length of wall, we've completely changed stance. You see, now this horse is standing more on the bottom of its foot the way it should. It has its, it's got a larger base of support 
and with very little uh, stress taking place. Now let's talk about a couple negatives that we see when a foot's trimmed with link with heel in the wall. One is you see all these little, see how this toe looks sh short and all these wrinkly lines coming on the foot. These, the hoof wall is in layers. We'll discuss that in a few minutes, but um, it's kind of like plywood. So if you bend plywood, one side is gonna have a shearing effect and the other side will have a compressive effect. Those will show in, in the hoof capsule. So let's come back and see to, to our foot here with the heel length. Look at our sole plane. It's coming down. It's coming down this way. It gets to this point and flattens off. That's what length of heel will do in the toe area. So it's actually bending up. If we look over here, we can see when the, when the foot's been trimmed to a horizontal plane, the distortion will show. That's the advantage of understanding what a uniform sole thickness means. Our sole is uniform in its vertical depth. It's not totally uniform, but it's a good guide. So following this, it's not a level sole plane. It's flattening out in the toe. It's lifting up a little bit. This lift that's developing here is causing these wrinkles on the toe. How do we know that? Well, look at a horse that crushes its heel doesn't have all these crushed up toe wrinkles because it's a different dynamics to how the toe is operating. It's not under a heavy compressive load anymore, although the one that crushes its heel. That's more of a horizontally plane P3 bone or a negative plane P3 bone. Both of those can have negatives and they both can have positives. So I don't like to use the word positive and negative because sometimes a negative plane P3 bone can really be beneficial for a horse at to a certain point. So we have to just learn how to manipulate feet and, and do what's needed at the time. And then when it's not needed, go away from that particular issue. Another thing that we see happening in this, in another negative to this foot is you notice this heel is not touching the ground. This is a this is not a level sole plane. It's got a bend in the toe and an upward bend in the heel. Both of these will settle out if you understand the principles of, of working on on leveling a sole plane. Then you learn how to manipulate these, and once you have a level sole plane, then you have a better base for your P3 bone and your ungual cartilage. A lot less problems developing to the foot if the P3 bone has a good base and if the elevation to the P3 bone is decent. So why is this heel going upward? Is because body weight is pushing down on this foot. This is obvious because it's flattening the toe air arch, but it's also causing a small dip here. This is touching the ground, so this is going as body weight comes down, the next force will be driving up. That's how a sheared heel is developed. Eliminating sheared heels is very simple if you can establish a level sole plane. They may not measure the same on both sides, but that's because that's how the foot is. So we need to stop thinking about making a foot look symmetrical because that's detrimental to a foot. There's another trimming technique that can have positives and negatives. The positive to a symmetrical looking foot is it looks pretty. The negative is it can cause a lot of damage because it's not addressing the internal structures of the foot. So moving on. Oh, here's our upward bend in our sole. And then here's our upward bend in our heel area. Got a little ahead of myself. So let's look at another very interesting thing within the foot. And that's the frog wall junction. In other words, where the frog separates from the wall. That's very unique and that this separation will align with the moisture line. So many of our landmarks in this foot align with the moisture line. It's just amazing. So by recognizing this, oh, and then to find this before I go further, um, most farriers will use their hoof knife or veterinarians and they will cut this frog out. They'll cut it out clean all this area up. One thing, this connection is very important. 
the frog's connection to the hoof wall is extremely important because that can limit how much the wall is pulling away. If you cut that out of there, you weaken the heel as far as its, its movement goes. It's, it's um, towards or away from the body movement goes. So that I would be careful about eliminating that connection. So you just take your knife and you shave this material away. Be careful not to shave too high, go too high, or you'll be in a situation you'd prefer not to be in. But just shave it away until you find this little separation, that's all. And then what does that tell us? It tells us the difference how the horse is standing on its foot. You see, any this is wall length. From this notch, frog wall junction down, that's all wall length. This is true heel right through here. Now remember, there are no absolutes. There's always so much going on in here that this, there's going to be variables to this, but this is a pattern that's very reliable. You just have to keep in mind that it's, it's not an absolute, so always be careful when evaluating this area. Once you study it long enough, then you'll feel very comfortable with deal, about how you to deal with it. But I love to watch, I love to go to horseshoeing competitions and look at horses after they've been shod because it tells me a lot about the farrier that's trimming the foot. And it tells me his knowledge, his or her knowledge on how he's having that horse stand on its foot. This horse is standing more on a forward pitch. I like to use the words pitch and roll and y'all because those are nautical terms or aviation terms and they're uh, generally recognized in the language. We don't use them in our language, so we want to use other things. But this foot is standing like that first foot I showed you on its toe. So it's got a lot of stress in the heel area, and it could have, and nothing's guaranteed as far as what I say, but um, because of there are no absolutes. But again, patterns tell us everything, tell us a lot. So this is a good way to recognize length of wall simply by looking at that frog wall junction. Another foot, it's a very, all these feet are interesting. But if we look at this foot, here's our frog wall junction on this side and this side. And it tells us not only that it has length of wall and the heel on both sides, it tells us the angle of the bars are different. You see straight bar angles have straight walls, usually have straight walls and a narrower heel. Lower bar angles have wider heels because as this loads and the bar angle changes, it pushes the heel out, makes it wider. Now you can observe this in your upright pastern horses. Look at them, narrow heels, straight bars, narrow heels. Look at the flat footed horse. Most likely it's got a collapsed bar, low bar angles and wider heels. So the bar management is important. How we manage bars. We can't let them get out of control. So how do we prevent that? Shorten our period time. We can keep up with a foot if they're trimmed quite regularly. We can't if they're trimmed five weeks or beyond. It's very difficult, unless it's an older horse and you're not using it or anything like that. So here's our length of wall. Now we can put a window on, on the same foot and we can trim it to the frog wall junction and turn it on the side on the oblique and then we can see how this trim trimming to the sole plane aligns with the moisture line in the frog wall junction area always use caution so i mentioned moisture line let's see if we can cover it moisture line is an old saying um, the farriers years ago used to talk about the moisture line. I don't hear it that often anymore. But I'd like to try to explain the moisture line. But first we have to understand how the sole is put together. So the sole is, uh, has all these little thin layers. And, as, and each layer is the thickness of a non-sensitive laminar leaf. Uh, that's very interesting because the wall has thin layers. Those layers are the same thickness. The frog pad has layers those are the same thickness as a laminar leaf so everything is tied together here but these little laminar leaves will bundle up 
So if I put a little box here in our demonstration here, and here's our wall or white line in our uh, corium soli. Uh, corium and dermis are interchangeable. So if we, so these layers will be grouped in bundles, followed by a weak bond between the bundles. So here we have our bundles coming down through here, and here's our weak bond. Uh, I'll try to explain the weak bond the way I view it. This is an area that needs to be researched. Uh, it needs to be understood because it's critical on understanding like abscesses and things like that. So hair grows in spurts. Hair is keratinized material and it grows in spurts. And when, it's, when it uses its energy and it's running out of its growth, it stops and it will rebuild energy and then start growing again. Uh, plants do the same thing. Uh, alfalfa plant will grow and then will, and then it has to build energy. Once it gets to the flower stage and all the growth, now all the energy then goes into the flower stage. But anyway, a little off track. Um, so as these, as this is at a resting stage, before it starts laying down a new bundle of these little layers, there'll be a weak spot. In, in the foot. Most abscesses, sole abscesses, there's a difference between sole abscesses and bar abscesses, but the mo sole abscesses generally are right here under the very first bundle. This is very thin tissue, it's very soft tissue, and, and it's uh, not very strong, it hasn't developed its strength yet. So when the foot shifts around a little bit, uh, it can shift those bundles, tear them, and that's where your abscess will be, usually be found. Most abscesses are, are develop at the end of the shoeing period. After the foot gets long is when you use the avier corns and abscesses developing. Then our moisture line is a weak area uh, between the moist epidermal sole and the dry excess sole. So if we were to add some excess sole now, the weak area will separate when the moisture recedes, sloughing the excess sole. So let's think a lot about the moisture line and how it affects all the tissue around it. Because when you usually see separations, that's generally where the moisture line is, is separating between things. It doesn't have to be that way, but that, I'll, I'll explain that in just a few minutes. So I hope that kind of a clear enough definition or explanation of the moisture line in the foot is just the difference between the moist epidermal sole and the drying of the uh, uh, exfoliating sole. So we can put a window in a foot and now it's hard to look at the sole body. So here's our sole body. You notice I'm not including everything as the sole body. I'm only including the epidermal sole, the moist epidermal sole coming through here. The next thing we can see is where the sole interfaces with the hoof wall and the white line. It's better, it's easier to see it on this side. Here's our white inner wall or white line and then our sole. This connection here is very unique because it's a fixed connection. It can migrate as tissue changes around it then the white line can migrate. Uh, and and the foot can the bone as the bone loses the whole of this migrates north. Another thing we see then is a bundle. So if you look at these little separations through here at these little weak spots coming all through the foot, uh, coming through here and here and here, all of this we can see where they're separating. If you look right here, this bundle is starting to separate from this bundle. You notice the difference here, that little separation there. So that's getting ready to slough off. If we look at our moisture line, we can now follow the moisture line. So where these cracks usually end, well, is somewhere close to the moisture line. Unless they're diseased, then they can go further up or they're shearing apart. Uh, they can tear further up, but normally they will separate where the moisture line, where the, where the sole would end the epidermal sole can end. So we can look at this separation here, follow our moisture line up, and as we get into the depth of the commissure, 
uh, comma sewer is an interesting statement. Basically, it just means that it has two anatomical parts on each side. So here we have our soul and our frog making the comma sewer. And if you notice where it's where our moisture line is aligning, it's pretty close to where this is separating. We can follow it through and come on down, follow the moisture line all the way down through here. So as this soul dries out, it's most likely it would separate here at this moisture line. And then, of course, you can see the layers uh, of the frog pad. Like I said, the hoof wall actually has layers. That's kind of a very easy dissection to do. It just takes two years to do it. But it'll show you that each fine layer of the wall is the thickness of a non-sensitive lamina leaf. Now we can talk about abscesses. So a common area for young tissue to shear is right in this area right here. Just be, Cursor doesn't seem to be working very good. Um, right, right below the very first bundles where abscesses usually appear because the tissue is soft. It's, 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 it's not very mature. It's still young tissue. And so it's easy to shear. Now, how do these layers shear? These layers are like plates in the, in the ground. Uh, when they fail, they'll, they'll shift. Well, when the layers of the soul shift, they can st cause stress in, in that weak bond. And the closer it is to this sensitive tissue, the more likely the, the papillae for the soul aren't very long, deep. Well, they can be deep. The little sockets can be deeper or less deep, depending on moisture of the soul. But, um, but they have uh, arteries and veins and, and nerves. So when they shear, you can have some seepage that can get into that area, causing it to bleed. And then if it can't be removed fast enough, then it'll build a gas, and then the gas will build into an abscess. Well, most veterinarians and farriers dig abscesses with the hoof knife, and they use it as a gouging tool. But it's very easy. It doesn't take much pressure to just go through this layer right here. Very little pressure will put you through that layer, and then you're going to have blood. So if you simply learn to shave through these areas. You see, here's the air area. We can shave through these areas until we get to the abscess. Then you can shave the tissue around the abscess if you want to make it a little bigger and quit. And most likely, you won't get to blood. Now... Soul abscesses are shearing problems, are usually caused through shearing. But if it hits the ground, it flexes. When it flexes, these soles can be like an earthquake. Well, I talked about earthquakes. Whenever this foot, when the foot hits the ground, there's an earthquake taking place in there. So how it hits the ground, um, how hard it hits the ground, or how un uneven the trim is, the trim may set it up so when it hits the ground, it can shear these layers. And there's all variety of things that can shear layers of the soul. So we just have to be aware of, of why those are caused like that. And then we just shave up around them until we get to them and drain them down. Now, you see this red spot right here and going right through here. That's a little trap blood in there. Um, if you should take a heel down too fast, when you come back to reshoe the horse, you may find a little red pocket there, it, just like what you see here. Well, a lot of farriers, you know, you guys, you take your knife and you shave that out and pretty soon it's gone. Well, the reason it's gone is because you simply shaved into the layer above it. Just quit. Don't go any deeper than you have to. Just quit. But you cleaned it up. And that's the same principle you can use when trying to clean up an abscess. But I mentioned soul abscesses are more shearing. Bar abscesses are more compressive loads. So... When the P3 bone pushes down on top of the bar, it flexes the bar outward. And that can cause the bar to bend and break. Well, that breakage is severe, and that's why they can bleed, because it's a more of a breaking situation than a shearing situation. So uh, most abscesses will track through the foot just like this one. They don't go vertical. They go lineal, just running along the line this way. So... Uh, like I say, bar abscesses are more of a breakage type of a thing. And then uh, removing length of wall in, in the heel area too fast may cause this. Why? Because you, this year, you sheared layers. 
Usually when you come back in six weeks and you clean that up, it'll go away. You, once you establish a lower heel, uh, I shouldn't say a lower heel, but a better foot trim than leaving heel, then you won't have problems. You shouldn't have these problems in the, in the toe. Pretty much eliminates abscesses unless people let the foot get long anyway. So here's a review, window cut into the foot to verify sole thickness. And here we have our frog wall junction right in this area. And we have uh, what's referred to as uniform sole thickness or UST. Uh, trimming to the sole plane and trimming to the UST are the same trim. They just have different meanings. So the sole plane addresses how the horse is standing on his foot. And when we use the term uniform sole thickness or UST, it's addressing uh, distortion to the sole, uh, to the sole plane when it distorts and you have sheared heels and things like that. It identifies a lot of the distortions. If you understand that the sole is fairly uniform, so when you trim it and the foot's not level underneath, that's a, usually a bend in the sole plane. So our next job is to figure out how to level the sole plane. Now we can talk about trimming the heel to UST landmarks. So we can go to our frog junction, frog wall junction, and then there's our length of wall. So any wall beyond the frog wall junction is length of wall. Can we trim to the frog wall junction is the next question we have to answer. So here's a foot that's been trimmed to the sole plane. Now I want you to look closely at this tissue. There's no way this horse could walk, could be comfortable on the ground trimmed like this. That's because this tissue hasn't been toughened up yet. So whenever you trim a horse the first time to the sole plane, you go slow and go easy. This opens up the heel. You notice this heel's all protected with the length of wall and the frog. Uh, all dirt can hold in here, get all packed in here. That creates a lot of problems in the seed of corn area. It can keep this more moist, softer tissue, more moist. So when you trim this down, this is a softer tissue. It could be the same thickness as the toe, but it's soft. So it's more subject to vibration, feelings coming off of vibration, tenderness. So before you put a force on the ground, barefoot, trim to the sole plane, you need to know that it can stand on the ground, barefoot, trim to the sole plane. This one I would not put on the ground. Well, soft ground maybe if it's not doing anything until soft ground would dry the soft, warm ground would dry this sole out very fast because it's the heels all opened up. So this tissue will dry down very fast. It's exposed more to the surface. And then when it dries down, it toughens up. But these are things you have to take in your stride, one step at a time. So what we're looking at is the width to the white line here, here in the seed of corn and to the bar. When they're fairly well uniform, that's when you quit. You don't need to trim beyond that point. If we look at the other side, we see that it's getting longer, it's getting wider. We're starting to see some of the striations or, or the, the terminal lamina taking place in here. So we have to be careful. We're going to, now we've invaded this. This is the only time I could say a horse has been trimmed low in the heel, a low heel is when you invade the sole, sole plane. If it looks, if you look at the external portion of the foot and it doesn't look like it has what most people want to call a heel. It's just a foot type. It's not necessarily a horse that doesn't have a heel because they all have heels or they'd be terribly bleeding. There wouldn't be any tissue there. So just keep in mind. And then once you, when we're at this stage and you come through here and, and clean this out, and if, it, if your eye tells you you can trim to the sole plane, then this sole plane is telling you you can trim to the frog wall junction. But if this tissue's way above the frog wall junction, I wouldn't trim to the frog wall junction because the foot's most likely a prolapsed sole, not allowing you to get there. Or it's just a lot more moisture. It's too soft. The heel's too soft. Don't take it there. Always trim off of the white line into the heel area. But this is a guide telling you where the true heel really is. Can you get to it today? Maybe not. Might take two or three trimmings to get there. That's if you choose to. You don't have to do this. 
I'm just explaining, I'm explaining anatomy. I'm telling you what the true heel is. How you trim it is your call. So keep that in mind. But the more heel you can get off, this poor mouse isn't working. And the more heel that you can get off a foot, the better the foot will be in the long run and, and with shorter shorter trimming times. A lot less problems in a foot that doesn't have, that standing closer to its true foot than standing on a false foot. I think I've covered that. So here we can have fun with this one. The plane of the hoof capsule versus the plane of the distal phalanx. So what are we talking about? The plane of the hoof capsule is what the horse is standing on. Now, is the stand is it standing on by simply looking at the bottom of this foot? Is it standing? Is the bone horizontally planed? No. This could be a T square trim. I I really pick on the T square trim for for some reason, but I just don't see anything positive to it. Because you've got the knee bent and you're looking over a foot and you're trimming it so it's T square with the cannon bone. That's what this that's that's what this foot could be right here. So when the horse stands on its foot, the P3 bone's not on the same plane as the horizon. You have a twist, you have stress taking place to different joints and to different uh, tissue. There's there's the plane of the capsule, I mean, of the P3 bone right there. So we have two different planes. It better serves the horse to bring those planes on the same plane. So when the horse stands on its foot, these bones will have a chance to align. You may not like it the first time you do it. You have to, it takes two or three trims before a soft tissue to adjust to the trim. I mean, you're not just trimming a foot, you're altering soft tissue tendons and ligaments, all of that is stressed when you change a trimming technique. All of that is stressed when you take a long-footed horse and trim it short, when you let horses get long. You probably wouldn't, if, if a horse owner changes farriers, they shouldn't be riding that horse the very same day or the next day. They should hand walk that horse for a while so the tissue can adjust to the new farrier's trim because it's very rare to find two farriers that trim alike. Um, maybe one was taught by the other one, they might trim somewhat alike. So whenever a fair horse owner changes farriers, you're changing new signals to the foot and it needs therapy. That foot needs to be a walking therapy for a while to get that tissue to straighten up and to align with the new trim. So keep that in mind. But the main thing I want to mention here is this is in a, the P3 bone is in a pronated position. How do humans stand when they're pronated? Their ankles are, their arch is flat on the, their, their arch goes flat, their ankles come in, their knees go out, and their shoulder comes up. Start looking closer at horses when they're pronated. Start looking closer at horses when they're pronated. They look terrible alignment. The alignment looks terrible. Get the pronation out and then give the couple trims after you take, eliminate the pronated bone, Give yourself a few trims and then look at the alignment. You might be quite surprised on how much that has changed. So now we can observe and compare the two between the before and after trim. So here's our frog wall junction. So what do we see? We see a straight inner wall and a low angle to our bar. A straight inner wall, straight bar angle, low angle, low outer wall, low bar angle, a wider heel, a narrow heel. We have an equal length of wall in the heel. This heel is longer than this one. So this foot's really uh, rolling to the lateral side with the P3 bone listing or rolling to the medial side. Two different planes. So let's um, look at trimming to the sole plane. Now we have everything on the same plane. We have our P3 bone and and our uh, sole plane and our hoof caps all on the same plane. So when the horse stands on its foot, everything is in more in alignment. And, and then it takes time to develop and adjust to the trim. But this isn't a level foot at all. That's another issue that we need to address in farrier science, is we've been taught to trim level feet uh, and uh, put a level shoe on a level foot. Why? Because 
we don't lose shoes. That's what we're told. And yet, hey, why, we should listen to what we say because we still lose shoes, don't we? But a distorted soul plane can be straightened out. And once it's straightened out, it's a pleasure to shoe these horses because now you have a level shoe going on a level foot. Here we have a level shoe going on an unlevel foot. Perfectly okay. That foot will level to the shoe. Remember that you, when you see a, a horseshoe, what do we see? The horseshoe is being nailed to the foot. We'll turn that around. What are we actually doing? We're, at, we're actually shoeing the foot down to a solid object. It's going to make major changes somewhere. The a solid object's not going to move, but the foot will. So we have to be careful how we nail this foot down to whatever object we're nailing it down to. Rock or toe shoes can really screw up a toe. Heels bent up can screw up heels because they all can distort the soul plane. So these are just things to think about. Maybe as time goes and you pay and we start paying more attention, these things will start being more, we'll be more aware of, of, of all the changes that could take place in a short period of time. So here's a foot that I used in another lecture on the hind foot lecture. Uh, it's got a major issue that I wanted to address, but I thought I would save it for for this for the heel lecture. Because here we have our white line. When the angle of the sole meets the white line, and then we trim the wall, even there you've trimmed to the sole plane. But if we look at this foot, our white line is below the sole plane. This is a prolapsed sole plane. This is normal. That's not healthy. The white line is down here. Now, farriers have seen this a lot, and they know they can't take this down anymore because it's going to get soft and maybe even bleed. But let's look at our frog wall junction. So this foot, we could not trim. It would be impossible. Well, I don't suppose anything's impossible. But I would not recommend trimming this foot to try to get to the sole plane. It's not ready to trim there because this is all prolapsed sole. It's way beyond the sole plane or the white line. But if you follow, track the white line through all this tissue, it'll come to the sole plane. It'll come to, excuse me, it'll come to the frog wall junction. But a good example of how we have to know and understand the heel before we just start randomly saying trim to this part of the heel, trim to that part of the heel. Because all of those are important things that we do say, what you say you're responsible for and liable for. So think about what you say before you, if you don't have the science backing up your statement, then I'd be pretty quiet because it's a pretty poor argument. I argue, I, I get in discussions with other farriers and, I, and they just have nothing backing up their discussion except what someone else told them. So this industry needs to change and hopefully it will be changing once we get into the foot. And then this is just a side view of the same foot showing the rounding uh, of the bone uh, stress in the P3 and ungual cartilages, which can produce pelostitis, can advance into osteoporosis if it gets bad enough. So, so what do we see here? Basic anatomy, vertical depth and heel and angle of heel. So if you notice that both these feet have different angles to their heel, both these are vertical depth. Both of them have different angles to their heel. So what is it we're really looking at? Two different heel types, two different conformations. Um, I mean, people want to make things look matched. Well, what foot are you going to change? You can't take this, this heel down anymore, so you have to raise this heel. What did we just talk about? Raised heels, length of wall in the heel, how much damage it can do to a foot. So to make this foot look like this foot, we're going to have to destroy it. We're going to have to damage it in order internally. Oh, external. If you're, all, if you're only into looking at aesthetics, then a lot of people shoe horses and make feet look real pretty and match and charge a lot of money for it. But you're paying for damage that can occur inside when you do that. So keep that in mind. You might be paying for them to put your horse out of business. I've never seen a cosmetically looking foot be healthy inside. 
and I can, I, I hate to say that because so many people believe in symmetrics and so many people believe in cosmetics. Well, a well manicured nail looks nice. It, if it's long, it's not going to last very long. It'll break on you. So keep just keep in mind that our industry needs to start addressing the internal structures of this foot. So the two different types could be simply a quarter horse and a thoroughbred. So why do we want to make what you, what most people would call a low heeled thoroughbred? It's not low heeled, it's a foot type, except it. Because your horse should be better off. When we shoe horses, we should treat every foot independently, not put them all in one group. Not all toes should be trimmed to 50 degree toe angle in the front feet because that means you're, no, all four feet are different. So your work, you, you, you best serve the horse by treating each foot independently and put some of this stuff people have told us over the years behind you. We want healthy horses. We want horses to be happy. So hopefully over time, our industry will change and start looking more and more internally. And people doing lectures will start having more science to back them up. So I'd like to thank you. I'm sorry I got a little carried away on this subject, but it just bothers me. When I sit in a room, listen to someone talking at a podium, giving poor information that's not backed up by any science, but just backed up by hearsay. So. I could be faulted for some of that because most of my work is a lot of my work is observational studies, but I got 50 years backing them up. I may not have the detailed science put to it, but I open that up. I'll help anybody. Anyone wants to challenge my work, you're more than welcome to, and I'll help you challenge it because the best thing for me to happen to me is for me to be wrong. I will thank you for it because you've helped my education. So thanks again, everyone. That's the heel lecture. I could go a little different, a lot more on it, but I'm trying to keep these short. So I hope everybody has a good time and enjoy.